Hi, everyone. We're so excited to welcome you to the next webinar in our People Fundamentals series, Making the Most of a Pivotal Moment. My name is Jamie Aiken, VP of HR Transformation at BetterWorks, and I'll be your moderator for today. Before we get started, I'd like to go through a few housekeeping items so you know how to participate in today's event. All attendees are in view only mode. Please submit any questions for our presenters in the Ask a Questions question box below the slide screen. You can send your questions at any time during the presentation and we'll address them at the end of the at the Q&A portion at the end of the event. This webinar is being recorded and all attendees will receive the recording post event. The slides are already linked in the related content section below. And as a thank you for joining us, we're offering all attendees complimentary copies of John Doerr's books, Measure What Matters and Speed and Scale. Please complete the feedback survey to claim your copies. The survey can be found by clicking the clipboard icon on the far right of the dock. Now let's begin by welcoming our speakers. John Doerr is an author, venture capitalist, and chairman at Kleiman Perkins. He was an original investor and board member at Google and Amazon, and has served entrepreneurs for over 40 years, helping them build bold teams and disruptive companies. He's a pioneer in the clean tech movement and has invested in zero emission technologies since 2006. And this past year, he and his wife collaborated with Stanford University to launch the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. And Andrea Lagan is the Chief Operating Officer at BetterWorks. She brings over two decades of experience leading functionally diverse teams in employee and customer success, professional services, marketing, and more. She's passionate about aligning teams and is a strong believer in understanding the employee and customer journey in order to drive organizational growth and facilitate change over time. And once again, I'm Jamie Aiken. I'm the VP of HR Transformation at BetterWorks, and I have over 20 years of experience in organizational development, cultural transformation, and employee engagement. I also recently collaborated with BetterWorks CEO, Doug Dennerlein, to co-author a book titled Make Work Better, revolutionizing how great bosses lead, give feedback, and empower employees, which will be available in April of this year. And now just a bit about our People Fundamental Series brought to you by BetterWorks. Our series is a monthly webinar program from BetterWorks that features the best thinkers and experts in the areas that matter most to HR leaders, like performance management, employee engagement, DEI, and more. Our goal is to inform, inspire, and facilitate a meaningful dialogue that can make both work and the world better for all of us. We're passionate about that mission and we're thrilled to have you all here. So without further ado, I'm excited to dive into this particularly important conversation today with John and Andrea. So we have an audience today of HR leaders and professionals, which is slightly different audience than perhaps the ones you're most accustomed to. And a lot of what we're gonna to discuss today is how HR can uniquely lead businesses to take urgent action needed to slow the climate crisis. John, your second book, Speed and Scale, is aimed at addressing the climate crisis. What led you to write it? Well, my journey begins with my daughter, then 16-year-old Mary Dorr, when I took her and our family and friends to see Al Gore's movie. Do you remember in 2006, An Inconvenient Truth? Yes. Well, I had uh, with me at that movie an inconvenient youth, namely <laughs> Mary Dorr, and after we watched the movie, we went home with family and friends to have a discussion. We went around the table and some of my Republican friends, I remember saying, it looks like the planet's getting warmer. Not sure the cause is man-made. Uh, I'm concerned, I'm not concerned. When it came to Mary, what I want you to know is she, she looked straight at me and she said, Dad, I'm scared and I'm angry. Your generation created this problem you better fix it. And the room went silent. No one, including me, knew what to say. So I set out with my partners at Kleiner Perkins to learn more about this climate crisis and, uh, and to take action to back entrepreneurs and innovators. 
uh, we put about a billion dollars over five years in a hundred different companies, most of which failed, some of which succeeded. But that's not the point. If we fast forward to today to the Paris Accords, what we have for climate is lots of goals and pretty broad agreement on what the goals ought to be. But for many, they're overwhelming. Uh, for others, they're too fuzzy. And what we don't have is a plan. And so this looks like a book, but it's not really a book. It's a plan. It's a set of Andy Grove style objectives and key results. 10 clear objectives and a handful of key results that show us how we can how we can satisfy the, the, the anger and questions of the young people who will inherit this earth. So let's begin first by laying a foundation here. So I don't want to assume we're all working from the same understanding. What exactly are we talking about when we talk about the climate crisis? And what is the speed and scale plan to cut emissions to net zero by 2050? Great questions. Exactly what we're talking about is that we today dump 59 gigatons of carbon pollution, that's CO2, methane, other greenhouse gases. We dump those pollu pollutants in the atmosphere as if it's some kind of free and open sewer. And the recent effects are all around us from vast flooding in Pakistan to uh, torrential atmospheric rivers in, in the U.S. wildfires, hundreds of billions of dollars of, of, of damage. I don't need to, to, to dwell on that. But this plan lays out 10 objectives with 55 key results to cut emissions to zero by 2050. I want to show you a couple of slides. The first deals with our emissions. Next slide, please. Thank you. And th there, there are six. To solve this problem, there's broad agreement among scientists that we need to electrify our transportation systems and then decarbonize the grid. That's the biggest opportunity of all, some 19 of the 59 gigatons. Fix our food systems, both how we grow our food and voluntarily eating somewhat less meat. Uh, protect nature, which means stop the deforestation of the rainforest. The, the, the devastation of deep ocean trawling. Number five is a hard one, clean up industry. That refers to how we make cement and steel. Those account for some eight gigatons of emissions. And then finally, since those first five add up to 49 of 59 gigatons, what that means is that we haven't, J Jamie, uh, eliminated all the carbon there's still going to be stubborn carbon that we're emitting. And so we've got to find ways to remove that carbon, both natural means, planting more forests, and mechanical means, what's called direct air capture. That's how we get to net zero by 2050. Now, there's more to the story than that. This is truly a wicked problem, and it's because we're fast running out of time. So the plan includes four big accelerants. Jim Collins would call these big hairy ass goals. We've got to win at politics and policy. We've got to turn movements and protests into real action. We've got to innovate. My friend Al Gore likes to say we have all the technology we need today to get this done. Uh, that's not quite right. We've got all the technology we need to get halfway there, but we need more innovation. And finally, we must invest. We've got to take dollars that are being devoted to fossil fuel infrastructure and directed to clean energy. The good news is clean energy systems are cheaper today in almost every place in the world than their fossil alternatives. So let's go deep into just one of these. I'd, I'd like to show you uh, uh, electric transport. Let's let that be our objective. That's to reduce eight gigatons to two gigatons by 2050. Now, you'll, you'll see here that the key results we need to achieve this goal are just six key results, 1.1 through 1.6. And by the way, I want to emphasize this whole plan is available for free on the web right now. You can go to speedandscale.com. You can download the whole plan. But you'll see that key result 1.1 calls for electric vehicles to achieve price performance parity 
in the U.S. by 2024. And of course, if they're not price performance competitive, people will not pay a premium for a greener alternative. And uh, if you go to the plan on the website, you'll find that we're now grading our progress against each of these key results. What separates a great group of goals from an actionable plan are key results, which you'll remember from Andy Grove, are measurable, specific, time-bound, and, and, and readily graded. Uh, we're currently off course on the EV price comparison. That would say that internal combustion vehicles in the U.S. by 2024 need to be $35,000. And in India and China, they need to average $11,000. We're selling more EVs, but we're not on track yet to achieve that goal. Key result 1.2 says one of two personal vehicles purchased by 2030 are electric. As of the year just ended, we were at 10%, not 50%, but 10%. So we're making progress, but our key result is a ways off from being achieved. Each of these key goals is achievable, but they're ambitious, they're stretch goals. I'm gonna pick one more for you to illustrate an important other facet of this plan. Let's pick a uh, key result, objective number eight, which is movements, turn movements into action. Key result 8.1 calls for us to make climate a top two voting issue everywhere in the world. As today, sorry, in the top 25 emitting regions. As of today, it's only a top two voting issue in some European countries. As you know, it's not a top two issue in the US or in China, India or Russia or other top emitting countries. So, so we are off course with this key result 8.1. Some of my favorite key results, the most majestic of these are key results 8.4, 8.5 and 8.6, which deal with education, health and economic equity. Those are measures to ensure that we not just make this transition, but that it be a just transition. Now, as our HR professionals will, will know from their work with OKRs, these are not meant to be exhaustive. This is not the list of all the things that have to be done, but they've been chosen by climate scientists and our team to be goals that are clearly measurable, ambitious, and that we can focus on. And I'll, I'll say again, you can see the full plan track all 55 key results. They're regularly updated at the website speedandscale.com. Uh, here's, here, here's, here's a sample from that website that tracks the progress against okay. these various goals and provides resources. Um, I'm not here today to say this is the only plan or even that it's the best plan, but it is a plan designed by scientists and engineers embraced by policy people that uh, we, we, we can rally around, that, that we, we can use to inspire hope and commitment and track our progress on this task. Bill Gates is fond of saying, this is the hardest thing mankind has ever tried to do, move to a new clean energy economy. And we've got to do it. Amazing. And I mean, we know that speed and scale isn't specifically around ESG. In fact, uh, it's focused on the E and the climate crisis specifically. Uh, but that's becoming an increasingly important area of focus for business, and, you know, rightly so. Can you talk to us a bit about why, purely from a business perspective, having a strategy here is essential? Sure. And let's let's start with the biggest of big pictures, because this is about much more than business. The Business Roundtable, a very influential, powerful group of executives, revised the purpose of the corporation. It used to be in Milton Friedman's speak, the goal of a company was solely to make a profit. But they declared, led by Doug McMillan of Walmart, but they declared that in addition to serving their shareholders, the corporation should deliver value to customers, invest in employees, deal fairly with suppliers, and support the communities in which they operate. All this is more than second nature. I think this is the North Star. This is the, the prime directive for all of our HR professionals in this audience. Uh, Laureen Powell Jobs put it best in the closing quote in this Speed and Scale book. 
She said, we should look on the climate crisis as the greatest opportunity that humanity has ever been presented with. We can correct longstanding injustices while preserving a habitable planet for generations. So from a business perspective, I think solving this crisis, uh, 8.4 can be the way the world achieves universal primary and secondary education by 2040. You wanna do the biggest thing throughout the world for the climate crisis? Get universal girls education. The payoff in terms of family, society, governance is, is enormous. We can eliminate the gaps in racial and social economic groups, mortality rates due to greenhouse gases. We call for that by 2040. But I'm, I, I'm very excited about the economic opportunity. This transition to a new clean energy will create 65 million jobs, new jobs. And we've got to make sure they're equitably distributed and they outpace the loss of the fossil fuels. The transition is not going to be easy. We're not having some kind of green party here, kumbaya, granola, crunching sandals. There will be winners, there will be losers, and every nation of the world, every business, should fight for its unfair share of this new clean energy future. And as an investor and board advisor, is this the kind of conversation you're actively having with the companies that you work with? And, you know, I mean, what can businesses do? Absolutely. You know, uh, companies are increasingly concerned about the climate for business opportunity and risk reasons, and because of its importance to your customers and to the talent. Over 60% of the Fortune Global 500 companies have made some kind of climate commitment. The most important action that a company can take today is to set a clear and measurable commitment to cut its emissions to net zero. Cutting emissions to net zero is the only way we can fully decarbonize in time. Yeah, I, I, there's no question that HR leaders are increasingly feeling the impact um, that, you know, of the importance of this as it relates to the employees. Uh, you know, when you think about recruiting, especially younger generations, this is definitely something that's becoming louder and louder. And at BetterWorks, we see it with our own employees and those of our customers that ESG is just as important, you know, to their employees. So I have a, a sort of a three-part question here. So the first would be, does this push from, ta from talent change how companies should respond? And if so, how? Well, look, I, I think talent and prospective talent are sending a really clear message to employers. There was a recent survey of 2,000 students in 25 business schools. 51% of them would accept lower salaries to work for an environmentally responsible company. That was done at Yale in 2021, the survey. Employees and talent are increasingly demanding, savvy, and aggressive about what positive climate action really looks like. Commitments are an important first step, but the plans in progress are coming under greater scrutiny as both the public and the workforce look for companies to, 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 to walk the talk. Yeah, um, I, I think, you know, when you think about what people really want every day when they get up and, and decide to come to work, people want to connect to something that's bigger than themselves. They want to connect to, um, you know, something that they can be a part of that really makes a difference in the world. Like, you know, that's, that's inspiring for everyone, regardless of your role. And the unique position that HR leaders have um, in helping their companies, their organizations really, um, you know, make a difference, impact the strategies that those companies have in place. They have so much power and so much influence in the types of programs that get defined across an organization that connect the employees to what's, what's really important and what's meaningful. Um, you know, to inspire engagement um, it, through that connection and build a level of trust and a level of learning and education that can be done both through programs supported by really great technology that enables kind of natural conversation, natural accomplishment or achievement of 
the things that are meaningful in an organization that support, you know, major goals like this, like we're talking about. So HR is um, very, very influential in how this happens yeah, across the entire organization. And Andrea, I, let me just uh, ask a, a, a different type of question. So how have you seen employee expectations evolve over time? Well, um, yeah, the employees, especially when you think about um, the younger generations and, you know, the realization of what the world might look like for them, they really want to know that, you know, where they're investing their time with the jobs that they hold, the careers that they're pursuing, the companies that they're aligning themselves to, that they are committed to making a difference. And on top of that, they want to know how they can be a part of it. And, you know, we see that happening through, um, you know, the values that organizations, um, you know, make public to their their customers, to their shareholders, to their employees. Um, the employees in the company want to see how, you know, that talk, how, how that actually walks across the organization. Are there goals in place that support the values? Are there actual conversations that are happening within the organization between, you know, me and my manager that, you know, help me feel empowered to help the company achieve these goals? Um, those are the things that employees are looking for today. And so how are HR leaders, I would say, uniquely positioned to impact business strategy when it comes to ESG policy? Yeah, I, well, you know, I think that, you know, a lot of it is um, how you set up the organization through the programs that you run across the organization to connect your people, to connect your employees, to your managers, um, the technology you use to make the empowerment and the enablement and the achievement of what's most important how you make that natural in the flow of work and everything that the employees do. Um, and that's a, that's a really important decision, you know, how you, how you want to put in place a, a platform that's going to enable achievement of goals and great conversations and feedback on how that's being done, how you survey your employees about what they know, what they don't know, how empowered they feel um, and the actions you take on that, all of those things, you know, are kind of the crown jewel of what um, HR enables across the organization to help deliver great achievement for their, their companies. So John, for companies that don't have explicit climate values baked into their mission, you know, unlike, a, you know, an electric vehicle maker, for example, where should they start? Oh, that's a great question. The most important step is to make a commitment to cut emissions and then measure and report those emissions to understand how we're doing against those plans. Uh, as Gordon, my mentor, Gordon Moore at Intel used to say, if you uh, don't measure it, you can't manage it. The, the, there's, there's great examples really of, of all kinds of companies, large and small, whose missions explicitly converge with climate goals. Uh, but uh, Meta, Apple, Alphabet have all set goals to get to net zero by 2040. Uh, Amazon has organized a Amazon Climate Pledge Group. Walmart is working with their supply chain. So there's a lot of, you're not alone in, in, in setting out these kinds of goals. There's also really impressive commitments from sectors of the economy where it's hard to abate the carbon emissions like shipping, mirrors, or cement. Lafarge, Holcomb, there's just, but the bottom line here is we're not going to get this done without strong goals. And though we don't have it all figured out, we've got to start now and, and be ambitious. Yeah. And so Andre, I'd love to hear your thoughts. How should employees be involved in contributing to this effort? Well, they should, um, first of all, understand the sustainable, you know, sustainability, um, objectives of the organization, but also feel empowered to contribute to um, those sustainability objectives. 
And, you know, there are lots of organizations out there now, many of which have chosen to operate in a very hybrid manner where, you know, maybe there's an office they go to, maybe half the time they're working from home. Some companies post pandemic have chosen to be completely remote. And, you know, there are very, um, I think, you know, Simple, I, I want to say simple, but, um, you know, simple is probably um, a little bit of an exaggeration, but there are ways that we can all um, educate our employees on how we can achieve these goals. You know, thinking about in the office, um, the what we have in place as far as how we um, burn energy in our offices. Do we have appropriate um, lighting mechanisms in place that allow for lights to automatically be turned off? Do we have in our offices like curtains or films that can be put on the window to decrease kind of, you know, heat and cold that might come into the buildings? Not every building yet has been designed in a, you know, really energy efficient way to John's point. Um, you know, things like um, a lot of us don't travel as much now um, as we did pre-pandemic. And, you know, John's um, key result 1.5 on, you know, traveling and transportation, um, you know, organizations that should think about the vendors that they use and even their sustainability efforts. So as an example, one of the vendors that we use to support um, any travel that our employees might use tells us what our carbon footprint is in the travel choice that we're making. And so, you know, just building awareness and educating um, folks on what they can do as individuals. Um, and I think, John, you're going to touch on this is um, is really important because the, the more interested we can make people in what's most important, um, you know, for the environment, for the world, um, you know, their heart then gets in it. And mm -hmm. when their heart is in it, um, they will make it happen. So why, Andrea, this one's for you as well. Why is a modern performance solution poised to be a difference maker in whether a company achieves its ESG goals? Yeah, uh, well, you know, a lot of it is how, um, you know, the, 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 process gets baked into day-to-day -day operations through technology. And, you know, going back to what I was saying earlier, it is really about how you design your technology to support what's natural um, between people, right? Conversations that happen between people um, that further an initiative um, or an objective, that's that's key to uh, achieving, you know, large, big, hairy, audacious goals. Um, how you deliver feedback to the company, how you how you survey a level of education or understanding or interest in your organization to then drive change from that. Those are the types of things that that allow for the connection to something bigger. Um, in a really, you know, kind of non-invasive um, and easy way. Yeah, it's about connection. So one of the outcomes we see and hear from our customers is a greater focus on organizational citizenship behaviors, those things that people commit to outside of their formal job description that positively impacts both the company and themselves. And John, in the book, you say individual actions are both needed and expected, but they won't be nearly enough to reach this huge goal. Only concerted, collected, global action can get us past the finish line in time. So what does that look like in practice? What's the first step we can all take? Well, uh, forgive the emergency vehicles in the background. I, I, th I think the most important step we can take is to engage our workforce in a thoughtful set of choices and a plan that's particular to our business. Some 70% of emissions are attributed to business activity. So this is 
not some small bright shiny object, but the main event. And I, I don't mean to dismiss individual actions, but individuals acting alone will not get us to where we need to go. So I, I wrote this book for the leader inside of every one of our employees, every one of our HR professionals to examine your sources of personal power and figure out how to affect others in conversation, in action, in behavior change, that the we're, 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 we're out of time where individually buying electric vehicles will get the job done. We need to get our school districts to adopt electric buses. We need to uh, decarbonize our transport of people and goods. We need to shrink the carbon footprint of the goods we manufacture. We need to purchase high quality carbon removal. We need to procure clean energy. And in fact, there's an action guide. This is material that was developed since the book was written. Uh, if you can pull up slide number 15 as, as a starting point for that, that shows the gigaton reductions for each of those four measures that an organization or company can take. There's equally clear and useful measures of other actions, like what you can do as an individual uh, to, to slide number 16, switching to an EV, powering your home with clean energy, eating less beef and wasting less food, substantial gigaton reductions. Uh, there's similar guides to what you can do working with your city. Building out protected bike lanes in cities is an incredibly cost-effective way to reduce, to cut emissions. So is updating building codes. There's been a miracle of building code development in California that's reduced emissions while the economy and has grown and people have prospered. State and local governments, there's a guide to what can be done there. Finance large energy projects, unblock and accelerate electrification. And finally, there's more work that can be done at the federal level. We had an amazing event occur last year when the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, some people say misnamed, was passed. But that provided an estimate of $266 billion of incentives to developing manufacturing and clean energy leadership in the US of America. Uh, we're seeing blowback from Europe as a result of that action. And the $266 million is not a cap, it's an estimate. Those tax incentives as written into law go on forever. And I, th I think by a very close vote have put America back on track to be a leader in this new clean energy economy. I wanna to return to the book for just a moment because it's full of goals, objectives, key results, wonky Intel engineering style speak. But to develop it, we interviewed a hundred different leaders from folks who work with indigenous tribes to 16 year old Greta Thunberg who staged school strikes in Sweden leading to a hundred million youth in a climate day action a year later. And we profiled 30 of those in stories. So what I'm trying to say is the book is written not only for the head, but for the heart. The most meaningful review I got of the book was from a reporter at Business Insider who said to me at the end of our interview, you know, John, I uh, take this book and I read a page or two of it every night to my daughter. And we discuss what this problem, this view, this solution can mean to the solution. Talking with our kids, engaging them in this issue is the way we'll get it done. Because when I talk now to my daughter, Mary, she's still angry and we haven't solved this problem. I say to her, Mary, it's gonna take your generation and mine working together to tackle this problem. Daughters seem to be uh, a running theme here as we sort of shift over to the Q&A. Uh, one of the questions is, John, my daughter was trying to buy an electric vehicle 
and the automotive industry was taking three to six months to give her a car. Do you know if the automobile industry has increased their production on electric vehicles? Uh, they are increasing production. The leader, uh, Tesla, I believe just announced to shareholders yesterday that they beat their production goals and they intended to double them to produce 2 million vehicles in this next calendar year, largely from their uh, Nevada plant. So uh, they're the pace setter. Whatever you may think of Elon Musk, he put the rest of the auto industry on notice and I believe accelerated the development of electric vehicles in the Western world by four or more years. I, I know the CEO of Volkswagen had Elon address his staff. But the real action in electric vehicles right now is in China, uh, both the size of their market and the degree of their penetration. It's greater than 10% of Chinese vehicles are electric vehicles. They still cost too much. There's not enough charging stations. But uh, tell, tell your daughter, she'll probably be telling you that Elon slashed the price of uh, Tesla's by up to 25%. And part of that was a bid to qualify for a $7,500 incentive that's part of this uh, powerful Inflation Reduction Act. I think we will get there with cars. I think fully decarbonizing the grid, dealing with our food system, changing voter sentiment, uh, those are gonna be harder things to get done. Uh, here's another question from the audience. I'm intrigued by number three about fixing food. Did John say that reducing meat consumption will affect our emissions? I'd love a further explanation on that. Yes, if, 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 if we were to cut, cut the amount of beef that we eat, not eliminate it, but cut it in half as an example, eat other meats that are less emission producing, uh, the, the, the global savings, I believe are three gigatons, three of the 59 gigatons that we need. Now there's other elements besides consumption. Uh, we can change how we grow rice to reduce the methane and nitrous oxide emissions. That's a half a gigaton. Fully a third of all food is wasted. If we just cut food waste from 33% to 10% globally, that's a gigaton worth of savings. If we improve the soil health through better farming practices, uh, there's two gigatons of savings to be had there. And I, I just yesterday committed to a pair of entrepreneurs out of Stanford University who have an ambitious program to do something very hard, and that's to measure and make available to the world through open data measures of the soil health ar ar around the, the planet. I'm very excited by what's going on in the innovation sector, particularly people that are focusing on solutions that can scale to meet the size of the problem. Um, another question here on electric vehicles. So the question is, how can you compare the U.S. to China and India when they're selling their uh, vehicles or their electric vehicles at a profit loss? Uh, both China and the U.S. aim to make a profit on their electric vehicles. There's not a to the best of my knowledge, and I will tell you, I lived through this, there's not a Chinese directive to subsidize their electric vehicle industry. Uh, they're procuring electric vehicles through their uh, centrally planned state, but that's unlike the solar panel strategy which they had, which was to subsidize selling solar panels below cost. Uh, in some respects, it was a great gift to the world but in, in others, it really decimated the U.S. solar manufacturing industry. Uh, coincidentally, again, I'm, I met with a novel new solar energy panel company that 
believes they can make a profit without subsidies and with the incentives that are in the IRA that uh, we'll see uh, a, a re rebirth, a re rebuilding a, of, of a domestic solar manufacturing capability. But some 70% of the solar panels today come from China, 80% of the batteries from China. We, uh, other nations of the world, India, the U.S., they want to, and they ought to be leaders in, in, in this great, hardest thing we've ever done. Um, so here's one, Andre. I'd like I'd like your take on this question. Um, how does greater adoption of remote work impact climate goals? So there's been studies done. Have there been studies done regarding the reduction of emissions uh, as it relates to commutes? Yeah, so um, I was I like that question too. I was hoping you were going to ask that one. Um, so as far as the actual data point, as far as reduction in emissions, I don't know the answer to that. Maybe John can. But um, what I will say is, you know, going back to the comment that John made um, a few minutes ago about his book being written really for. Um, the leaders in organizations, the leaders in all of us, um, you know, as we think about how we are empowered um, to help drive change within our organization, um, I think a valid question is to ask, um, you know, or leaders in an organization, is my presence in the office really needed in order to drive accomplishment, um, achievement of goals, um, or can I do that from home? And going back to the question you asked me earlier, Jamie, about you know the value of a, perform a, a really modern performance enablement system to support the achievement of you know, these types of, of goals, that type of um, performance enablement system being um, a part of how you engage employees in the organization, managers and employees through conversations and feedback and goal setting and achievement of goals. Um, that is a huge part of enabling a really productive and successful either hybrid or fully remote workforce. And so, you know, the, the two things together, I think, enable leaders to, um, to work with HR um, to to help affect an outcome, which I think we all intuitively know is very positive. If we're not on the road for two hours a day commuting one way or the other, um, and we're able to work from home, control our environment at home in a way that's much more sustainable, then you know the long-term payoff of that is really valuable. Yeah, so, there's something- Jamie, I wanna, Sorry, I, I, I wanna follow up if I can on, on this question that we were asked about the cows. It turns out that cows are one of the largest sources of methane emissions, which is one of the most potent of the greenhouse gases. Methane is anywhere from 20 to 80 times more potent, more damaging than CO2 is. If, if, the, if the billion cows that we have on the planet were a country, they would be the third largest source of emissions, third wow. largest. So Cutting down on beef and dairy consumption means we, we simply have fewer emissions. Doesn't mean you've got to go vegan. Eggs, chicken, pork, they all have lower emissions. But the plan calls for cutting emissions from food from nine to two gigatons by 2050 to, to get to where we need to go. I'm just still in my head, I'm thinking of a country that's populated by cows, a, mil a billion cows, that's crazy. <laughs> um, so here's the next question. I would love to know uh, what renewable energy sources John proposes in his plan. There have been increased studies on the dangers of certain renewable en energies such as wind. Sure, well, renewable energies is an incredibly bright part of this initiative and it, the plan calls for ramping up specifically wind and solar. Uh, countries like France already run 70% on nuclear and, and, and power is the single largest source of emissions that we have to cut. We need to go from 24 gigatons, this is objective number two, 
to three gigatons. So there's uh, 21 gigatons of gain. And the, the, the risk of inaction here is the, the real risk. We've got to find clean sources of energy while we're investing in long duration and affordable storage so that we can stay below a two degree temperature increase. Sorry, there's just a few other questions that are coming in that I'm scanning here. Um, so Andrea, you know, as we talk about, you know, we have a lot of HR leaders on the call here. So, you know, what are some immediate steps that HR leaders can take to start the conversation within their organizations? I think first of all, um, is your organization one that has a well-defined uh, set of sustainability values or practices, um, you know, that, that they, abide by or adhere to. If not, that's the first step. Second would be to really um, understand how much do the leaders and the individuals in the organization know ab about the uh, you know sustainability measures or goals um, that the organization has. How empowered do they feel in achieving those? What kind of conversations are you structuring um, in your, your engagement program across your organization between managers and employees that are focused on this topic? Um, are, you, are you sending surveys to your employees to gather information, to make decisions on? Those are kind of the first steps. And so, this next question actually links in well with that. So how can we make sure we're following through on our commitments when it comes to ESG and climate change as an organization? Yeah, I think, you know, making it a core part of, um, you know, communication, your communication strategy in the organization. Do you talk about it regularly in, say, all hands meetings um, or, you know, department meetings or one on ones that, you know, leaders and employees have uh, between themselves? But it's got to be a fundamental part of, you know, every aspect of the operating model in the organization. Yeah. Uh, this one, uh, Gallup did a long-term study about happiness and while working from home makes people's lives easier and now helps emissions, we also know that working together, because people are, you know, wired for connection, working together physically is also critical for good mental health. Do you, have you in, you know, in any of the studies that you have uh, conducted, looked at that connection or that correlation? And I guess the other question I would ask is, how do you foster connection in a more remote type environment or hybrid environment? Is that to me or John? Uh, that would be to you. Okay. Um, so, you know, I think, yes, agree. Like, you know, we all want physical connection with the people that we interact with on a regular basis, even with people that we don't interact with on a regular basis. Um, you know, there are a lot of benefits to, you know, not being on the road several hours a day. We talked about that. Um, you know, uh, organizations should inspire, let's, you know, use a fully remote organization or a hybrid organization as an example. You still want to find opportunities to bring your people together and ensure that there is a strong connection um, with those people, because at the end of the day, those people are the ones that are making things happen in your organization. But look for opportunities where in order to do that, are the vendors that you're using supporting some of the sustainability goals that are important to you as an organization. I mentioned the travel piece. If you're going to have people travel together to, you know, a specific location, understand what the carbon impact is of that, you know, that travel decision, that, um, you know, bringing people together decision. Those are, are things that are um, you know, really important. I think you're know, going back to the sustainability goals. Do you know what the 
objectives and values are of the vendors that you're using and how are they supporting what you are you know trying to do for your customers and your employees yeah. john do you have anything you want to add to that no i you know i work with a lot of small and new companies and they're on the front lines of fighting for talent we're all engaged in these talent wars and I, I can't imagine trying to build a high performance company without having a strong commitment to climate. That the youth are demanding this. I, I see it on the Stanford campus, uh, this new school of sustainability that they launched, the first one in 70 years. All the courses are already oversubscribed. They yeah. started with 90 faculty. They're gonna hire 60 more of them. There'll be thousands of grad students and postdocs. And, and we need lots of great sustainability schools, like we have lots of great medical schools. So I'm, I'm not here to say that Stanford's gonna be the be, be all and the end all, but young people want to study in these fields. They wanna work in these fields and they wanna do it for all the right reasons. So s smart, savvy employers know this and, and they're well ahead of it, but I, the, the, the campus has literally been electrified by the excitement over being able to go get a degree in law and, 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 and with a minor in climate. The, the saying is that climate science is going to be the new computer science yeah. in terms of where young people mm -hmm. want to work mm -hmm. and have impact. Yeah, and John, going back to like those 65 million jobs that are going to be created in support of this climate effort, you know, over the course of the next many years, um, every one of those employees is going to want to come to an organization that helps them achieve these goals. Um, and, you know, if, if these organizations, these companies don't have the ability to um, make that happen, you know, those employees aren't going to come to your company. Yeah. Right. Oh. So, 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 so I think uh, post-graduation programs, special masters, community college programs in climate are, are, are a big deal. Yeah. Uh, John, you, um, you started this session uh, with uh, a story about seeing a film uh, with your daughter. Um, what are some of the other books or films you'd recommend for leaders interested in tackling climate crisis? Oh, thanks. I'll do, I'll do a couple of books first. I, I love the book by Bill Gates, which is called How, How to Avoid a Climate Crisis. There's a new one that will just be out later in February, uh, created by Greta Thunberg, it's called. And this is The Climate Book. It's not a book of solutions, but... Remember, I went out and interviewed 100 different experts and, and, and put 30 profiles in the, the speed and scale book. She has 100 essays, really provocative ones, that, that show different parts of the problem interspersed with her editorial comment. Highly recommend that. Uh, for the Christmas holidays, our, our family gave uh, a book called The Ministry of the Future. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it's kind of near science fiction. It's, it's what the world would be like in 2040 by Kim Stanley Robinson. And it, it's a, a riveting uh, book about climate, climate change, and has, has a pretty optimistic ending. So those are some books. As, as for, for movies, of course, the classic is Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth. But uh, I've, I've watched several times uh, the Netflix best, second best movie ever called Don't Look Up. Uh, Leo DiCaprio, do you remember seeing that? Yeah. 200 million people viewed that movie in the 30 days it was released last December. And so I'm anticipating there's going to be more broad scale media efforts to, to get this message out. How about you, Andrea? What do you recommend people read or <laughs> How's that for an answer? <laughs> Great answer. 
Uh, just to wrap up the Q&A here, um, and it's just a little question. If there is one thing, it's to both of you, if there's one thing that each of us on the call can do today or tomorrow, what should it be? I think the most powerful thing we can do is vote and to insist that our elected officials in a city council, on a school board, in a state government, at the federal level, are committed to using the power that they have to get us to net zero. The second most important thing since we're all leaders in organizations, I, I believe is to work with our senior executive teams to get our organization to make a net zero commitment. Yeah. Those are hmm. two incredibly important pieces of power. Yeah, I was gonna say something similar. Um, I was gonna say, use your voice. Use your voice in two ways. Number one, to vote. And number two, to encourage your leaders to, you know, take action in this direction if you are a leader use your voice to you know help your employees understand how to drive this forward um but use your voice fantastic thank you both so very much um and on behalf of better works and our presenters we'd like to thank you all for attending today's webinar making the most of a pivotal moment don't forget to claim your complimentary copies of John's books, Measure What Matters and Speed and Scale by completing the feedback survey linked in the doc. It's the clipboard icon. Uh, you can also request a copy of Doug Dennerlein and my book, Make Work Better by the survey. And lastly, we'd, like, we'd love to inter invite you to our next People Fundamentals webinar on February 16th, titled Building an Enduring Human-Centric Company. HR industry analyst Josh Burson and Rivian's global vice president of talent, learning and belonging, Ben Putterman, will explore how the most resilient companies empower managers to thrive through change and successfully serve as the enablers of performance and purpose. Click the megaphone icon in the dock to register. We hope to see you there. Thanks again and have a great rest of your day. Bye everyone.